Hello, this is Mark Leslie, and I'm going to be doing a reading tonight. The reading is going to be a family-friendly tale. It's a science fiction or speculative fiction tale, maybe something you might feel is more in the uh, realm of the Twilight Zone. And it's a story called Looking Through Glass. Now, a uh, background on this story was this book, uh, the story was originally published in Stardust, edited by my good friend, Julie E. Ternada, who's a science fiction writer and editor. And this series, uh, Tales from the Wonder Zone, was meant to be science fiction designed to uh, employ the science curriculum for uh, Ontario, from Canada to Ontario. And this particular volume in the series, Stardust, was meant to be based on grade four science. So the whole idea was the science fiction writers that Julie was in contact with were to look up what was being taught at uh, grade three, four, five, six level, et cetera, and uh, design a story in which the principles of science from that grade could be used. And I wanted to use properties of light. And so that's something that would be taught at uh, grade four level. And my story, Looking Through Glass, incorporates, it's, it's sort of a little bit of a mystery story, and it's meant for young readers. So grade four level would be, you know, somewhere in the grade nine to 12, uh, age nine to 12 uh, level. So it is family safe. And so I'm gonna read the story, Looking Through Glass from Stardust. <clears throat> Looking Through Glass by Mark Leslie. Someone's been sneaking in here and stealing my ideas. Uncle Zach had told Paul on his last weekly visit to the scientist's house. Those very words rang in Paul's ears as he stood on the front step to Uncle Zach's house and spied through the front window, a long dark shadow moving along the wall. Paul stepped closer to the edge of the step so that he could better see the figure lurking on the other side of the window. As he got close enough to peer inside, he caught sight of a tall, gangly man standing in the middle of the room. The man was hefting a brick toward the window. Paul ducked, covering his eyes as the sound of shattering glass filled the air. Hey! he shouted, feeling tiny fragments of the broken window landing in his hair and bouncing off his face. What gives? Uncle Zach was leaning his tall, gangly frame out the window, muttering apologies as Paul felt cool liquid running down his forehead and face in several spots. So sorry, Paul, I didn't realize anyone was there. Paul brought a hand up to the liquid streaming down his face, thinking he'd, he'd been cut in multiple locations and wondering why his blood felt so cold. Uncle Zach, Uncle Zach, what's going on? Why is my blood cold and clear? Uncle Zach laughed and almost fell out the window. Paul, my dear nephew, you're not bleeding at all. But, but the glass, it's not regular glass. It's a special mixture I've developed. Taste it. Paul ran a hand along the liquid streaming down his face, then licked his fingers. Hey, it tastes like water. That's because it is mostly water. The door is open. Come on in and I'll explain. Still running a hand through his hair, checking for bleeding, Paul opened the front door and stepped inside. He made his way down the short front hallway and turned right at the first doorway, the doorway to Uncle Zach's laboratory. As he walked, Paul mused about the tastefully decorated room in the lab, which could be mistaken for a reading room or den, if not for the presence of a sink, some flasks, Bunsen burners, and other lab-like fixtures. When Paul was younger and didn't know his Uncle Zachariah de Bizenchik very well, he used to imagine that his uncle's entire house was filled with test tubes, pots of strange boiling liquids, jars with exotic contents like an eyeball or perhaps the heart of a dead cow, and maybe, just maybe, in a dark corner of one room, a tall, stiff, motionless body with bolts coming out of its neck could be spotted, waiting for the next lightning storm to bring it to life. But Uncle Zach's place wasn't anything like the labs of mad professors Paul had seen in movies or read about in comic books. And Uncle Zach himself wasn't anything like the professors in those same stories either. In fact, Uncle Zach was a man who loved to spend time with others and particularly enjoyed a good laugh. He made a point of extending a weekly invitation to Paul to come for a visit, especially after he'd learned that his grades in science were slipping. But Uncle Zach didn't just talk about science and technology with his nephew. He told him jokes, stories, and they sometimes watched movies together. Or they went to the local arcade. And somewhere in all that fun, Uncle Zach always managed to teach Paul something new about the world of science. 
And since those weekly visits began, Paul's grades started to creep back up again. When Paul walked into the lab, Uncle Zach was crouched on the floor near the window. Some of the broken glass fell on the floor in here. Would you mind helping me clean it up? Sure, Paul said, and he walked over to the utility cabinet to grab the broom and dustpan. You, you won't need those, Uncle Zach said without looking up. Grab that roll of t paper towels off my desk. Paul took the paper towels and walked over to his uncle. Looking at the floor as he handed Uncle Zach the paper towels, he didn't spot any shiny fragments of glass at all. Instead, there were little pools of water on the hardwood floor. With the paper towel, Uncle Zach wiped up the tiny droplets. Then he stood up, turned, and smiled at his nephew. Bet you never imagined cleaning up a broken window would be this easy. Paul shook his head, still not understanding what was going on. Now that that's done, how would you like to help me replace the broken pane? Sure, Paul said. Do you have a new one in here, or will we have to go to the hardware store? Neither. Uncle Zach smiled a wide-toothed smile and hooked a thumb in the direction of the window. See that green button on the window frame over there? Just go press it. Seeing the green button, just above a red one on the right side of the window frame, Paul walked over and pressed it. A hum sounded, not unlike the hum of a fluorescent light, and the edges of the frame glowed slightly. Then, after a few more seconds, there was a frame of what looked like glass in the previously painless window. Paul reached out and touched it. It felt cold, but it was solid. How did you make this? How is this possible? Paul asked, his jaw hanging down. Uncle Zach smiled again, let out a short laugh, and then spoke. It's a frozen water compound. Regular tap water, some chlorine, and a few other chemicals. Essentially, the window pane is made up of a very thin layer of clear ice. The window frame is really where I put in all the work. You see, the frame creates an extremely focused area, about one centimeter thick, that can maintain a consistent temperature. In this case, it's approximately zero degrees Celsius. When you press the green button, a thin layer of water drops out of the top of the frame and into the temperature core, freezing it into a fine sheet of ice. Paul looked at the window. It seems like a normal window, but ice isn't usually so clear. Isn't it usually fuzzy and bumpy? When formed naturally, ice usually is all fuzzy and bumpy, his uncle agreed, depending on where it's frozen and how long it takes to freeze. Chemicals like chlorine and the other ones I've added that are a little harder to pronounce, kind of like my full name, help keep the ice clear and clean. And the fact that it's less than a centimeter thick also helps assure that the light coming through the ice doesn't refract through so much. Wow, that's really cool, Uncle Zach. Thanks, Uncle Zach beamed, then reached over and pressed the red button. Within seconds, the pain was gone. See? The concentrated freezing has been stopped, and the unfrozen water seeps back down into the thin basin at the base of the window frame. <laughs> Easier than opening a stiff window. Everyone's going to want one of these. I imagine so, but not right away. It's still rather an expensive prototype, and so it might take some convincing before people would invest in it. Paul pressed the green button again and watched the pane of ice reform itself, as seamless and transparent as any piece of glass. Who wouldn't want one of these? I mean, so what if a baseball smashes your window? You press a button and the window fixes itself. Uncle Zach's grin spread. Yes, my original idea was to provide a safe and lasting window, but now I can see that there are other benefits. Just think, with these frames throughout your entire house, window washing will be a thing of the past. And I'm currently working on some of the water compounds to produce colored glass, mirrored glass, stained glass, all kinds of design effects. So, so what happens if you run out of water in the window frame? Uncle Zach walked over to his desk and grabbed a cylindrical plastic container with a peaked lid and went back to the window. When you run out of water for the pain, you simply take a bottle of the water pound compound, you insert it into this little hole at the top of the frame, and squeeze. With a variety of compounds available, people can choose whatever type of glass they want and instantly have their special glass. No installation necessary. Paul smiled. It sounds like once this invention takes off, it'll have endless possibilities. This is going to make you rich. Uncle Zach stopped, a frown creasing his forehead. What's wrong, Uncle Zach? I'm afraid to go out and patent this invention. Every time I take one of my inventions out to be patented, someone else seems to have come up with the exact same idea. It's as if someone were watching me and stealing all of my ideas. I remember you mentioning that before, Uncle Zach, but the last time you mentioned it, you said you thought someone was sneaking in here. Uncle Zach stroked his chin. Yes, I did. 
Then I notice that my ideas don't get stolen until I take them out of the house. How do you usually take them to the patent office? Paul asked. I've been renting a truck from the truck rental agency just down the street. Maybe we could be a little more sneaky this time. What do you mean? Do you usually rent a small truck? Paul asked. Yes, Uncle Zach said, a cargo van. That has windows in it, doesn't it? Uncle Zach nodded. Then maybe this time we should rent a cube van or, or something big without any way that people can see inside. And let's box the entire invention up in a large furniture or an appliance box. Then it won't look like an invention. It'll just look like we're moving some furniture. Uncle Zach smiled and patted Paul on the back. My, my, you're becoming quite the analytical scientist, my boy. You've taught me well, Paul replied, blushing. Please excuse me for a few minutes. I'm going to go call the patent office and see if they can squeeze me in this afternoon. I also have to call the truck rental place. They almost always have a truck available on short notice. With that, Uncle Zach strode out of the lab, leaving Paul alone with the new invention. He stood looking at the window for a moment, and then couldn't resist what came to mind. Stepping forward, he first tapped the glass, then made a fist, and drove the fist through the glass. It shattered into a million pieces. Paul looked at his hand. No cuts, no blood. He grinned a huge grin and pressed the green button. The window frame hummed, and the pain reformed itself. This is so cool! Again, Paul put a hand through the window, this time using a left-handed karate chop. Smash! Again, no cuts, no blood. He pressed the green button again, and the window hummed and reformed itself again. I've got to show this to some of my friends, Paul said, smiling. It's going to crack them up when they think it's regular glass. He laughed. This time, he chose a karate stance and then put his foot through the window. Smash! Green button. Hum. Reformed pain. Mocking an announcer's voice, Paul giggled and said, Please, kids, don't try this at home. Then he leaned forward and put his forehead through the glass. His head shattered the pain easily, and once again, there were no cuts, no glass, just the cool, clear water compound running down his face. This time, when he pressed the green button, it hummed, but nothing happened. Uh-oh. Did I break it? Paul looked around the room and spotted the small plastic bottles of water compound. No, 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 it's, it's just out of water. He walked over and picked up one of the plastic bottles and squeezed the contents into the hole in the top of the window frame. Then he pressed the green button. The frame hummed and the pane reformed itself. This time, though, the window pane was completely black. Oh, no. Oh, no. Something must have gone wrong. Maybe he'd injected the water compound in the wrong spot. He ran out of the lab to get his uncle. Uncle Zach! He met his uncle in the kitchen at the back of the house where he was speaking with someone on the phone. Uncle Zach gestured that he would be just one minute. When he finished his phone call, he put the receiver down and turned to his nephew. What's wrong, Paul? I, I, th I think I did something to the window. I, I broke it or something. What happened? Uncle Zach asked, and he headed back down the hallway with Paul following close behind. I was, I was playing with it. I was breaking the glass and reforming the window. Th then it ran out of water, so I injected more water compound into it. Only this time it turned out black. Black? Yes, you can't see anything through the window at all. When they got back to the lab, they looked at the window, only the window wasn't black. It was clear, transparent, just like before. Paul scratched his head. Honest, Uncle Zach, it was black. I don't know what happened. Uncle Zach picked up the plastic bottle sitting on the window ledge. Is this the compound that you used, he asked, sniffing it. Yes, Uncle Zach laughed. <laughs> I think I know what happened. What? This compound you injected is an extremely dense salt water compound. Because there are more particles in salt water, namely the salt particles, it takes light a little bit longer to pass through it. So when you first formed the pane, the light hadn't even passed all the way through the window. That's why the pane looked black. It likely took several minutes for the light to pass through. Freaky. It's similar to the stars we see at night. Most people know that some of the stars we've seen likely burned out thousands of years ago, but that it takes the light so long to reach us that, to us, they still appear to be there. I'd be very interested in testing the speed of the light through that window to see exactly how long it takes for it to pass through, Uncle Zach began stroking his chin and pacing back and forth. Suddenly he stopped and turned toward the window. A face appeared in the window, a wide, puffy face with black shadows under the eyes and a hideous-looking scowl. He's looking right at me, Paul yelped. No, he's not, Uncle Zach said, 
Remember, it takes the windows several the light several minutes to pass through the window. It's more likely that this ugly fellow was standing in the window of, the window a few minutes ago before we were even back here in the room. What he likely saw was an empty room. So he might not be standing there right now, Paul asked. Uncle Zach suddenly grabbed his nephew by the arm. Come on, Paul, let's hide. This guy could be the thief that's been stealing my invention ideas. They hurried toward the walk-in closet beside Uncle Zach's desk, keeping their eyes on the face in the window. The ugly man's eyes darted about the room. Then he grinned before he sauntered away from the window. Quickly, Uncle Zach said, ushering Paul into the closet. Just as the closet door closed behind them, they heard footsteps entering the lab. We just made it, Uncle Zach said quietly, pulling his cell phone out of his back pocket. Time to call the police. Through a crack in the, crack in the closet doorway, Paul watched the ugly man sneak around the room. He went to Uncle Zach's desk first, as if he'd been in the room before and knew exactly where everything was kept. He immediately spotted the cylindrical plastic containers with the water compound in them, grabbed one, and stuck the opening under one of his large nostrils. He squirted as if trying to figure out the scent, then rifled through the desk drawers. The police are on their way, Uncle Zach whispered, edging closer to the closet door to have a peek. Oh no, he's going to find my schematics for the window. As if on cue, a grin spread across the ugly man's face as he pulled out a manila envelope and peeked inside. He quickly folded the envelope and tucked it into his back pocket. He's going to get away with my invention idea, Uncle Zach whispered, unless I can stall him until the police arrive. You stay hidden in here, Paul. Uncle Zach opened the closet door and stepped into the room. Hello, Uncle Zach said in a light, pleasant tone. Can I help you? The ugly man looked shocked, and his eyes darted back and forth as he attempted to stammer out a response. You must be with a moving company, Uncle Zach offered, handing the man an easy explanation. Yes, yes I am, the ugly man said, beginning to stand up straight. There was no answer when I knocked, so I let myself in. That's great, Uncle Zach said. Now I um, was hoping that we could get started in this room. This desk and the bookshelves need to be moved. Did you bring any boxes that I could store the books in? The ugly man walked over to the bookshelves as if to examine them, and, hidden from Uncle Zach's view, he pulled out a knife. Paul gasped loudly. Startled, the ugly man looked toward the closet and spotted Paul through the crack. He stepped forward and yanked the closet door open. Come on here, he yelled, grabbing Paul by the arm and hauling him into the room. He shoved Paul in the direction of his uncle, keeping the knife pointed at them. Don't hurt the boy, Uncle Zach said, putting himself between his nephew and the knife-wielding man. Take my invention, just don't hurt the boy. You stupid fool, the man said. I've stolen every one of your inventions for the past year. I've been able to sell them for a good price, too. How have you done it? Uncle Zach asked. How did you know when to sneak in and steal the invention ideas? My brother owns the truck rental agency. Every time you phone to rent a truck, I know that you have another invention idea to sell. Then, it's a simple matter of waiting until you're not around, picking the lock, sneaking in, and grabbing the paperwork and plans. The ugly man then noticed the cell phone in Uncle Zach's hand. Wait a minute, he said. Did you call the police? I didn't have time, Uncle Zach said, shrugging. The man scowled and went to the window and peered outside. The street outside was quiet and empty, except for a young child on a bicycle speeding down the sidewalk. Well, I'm going to keep one eye on the window so I can see them coming. Uncle Zach smirked and whispered to Paul out of the side of his mouth. He isn't going to see anything out that window until it's too late. Now tell me, the ugly man said, waving the knife at Uncle Zach. What other invention ideas do you have brewing that I can take with me today? Uncle Zach shrugged and looked around the room. You must have something, even some unfinished notes. Those would still be worth a little bit of money. Just then a police car raced down the street and pulled into the driveway. Rats, the cops are here. The man began to run out of the den on his way to the back door. But just as he got to the den door, a police officer pounded on him, pounced on him, wrestled the knife out of his hand, and slapped the handcuff on his wrist. Another officer covered the man with his gun. As the thief was being cuffed and dragged away, the man stared blankly at the, at the officer's how did you get out of your car and into the house so fast? It, it should have taken you at least a few minutes. I, I don't understand. I had time to get away. Uncle Zach laughed and jabbed his nephew with his elbow as the police dragged their quarry away. Come on, Paul. Let's head outside so we can look in through the window and watch the police tackle that crook again. So that was the story 
looking through glass. Again, it was meant to be used to teach scientific, uh, science concepts to uh, children in grade four for the Ontario science curriculum. And uh, I had the great honor of uh, writing that story for my friend Julie Trinata as part of the Tales from the Wonder, no Wonder Zone series. And that was a series of science fiction stories meant to be used to teach the science curriculum. Again, uh, this is Mark Leslie. I hope you enjoyed that family-friendly tale. If you want to check out more of my writing, uh, there are free pieces available to download from ebook, and you can check them out over at marklesley.ca. Thanks for hanging out with me, and I look forward to sharing more stories with you in the coming days and weeks. Take care. Have a wonderful night.